Celebrating 150 years of Karl Marx's capital, distinguished professor David Harvey joins me in the studio to talk about the spirals of capitalism and his new book, Marx, Capital, and the Madness of Economic Reason. Then we meet with filmmaker Pau Faust, who captured in his film Ada for Mayor the unlikely successful campaign of Barcelona's Ada Calau from activism to governance. It's all coming up here on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Hundred fifty years after the publication of the first volume of Das Kapital, Karl Marx's analysis is as relevant as ever, says our next guest, and he's got millions of downloads to prove it. Distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, David Harvey has been teaching Karl Marx's Kapital for 40 years in classrooms, but also online as a free download. His most recent book just out is Marx, Capital and the Madness of Economic Reason. It takes a deep dive into Marx's curiosity about crises. Are they inbuilt into capital or imposed on it? Or to put it another way, if, as Marx might have said, capital is value in motion, where are we headed? David Harvey, welcome back. Thank you. So are we headed? If, if, if capital is value in motion, are we headed off a cliff? No, not necessarily uh, off a cliff. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that's remarkable about the history of capital is how it's managed to renew itself. And it goes through a crisis and it comes out uh, looking completely different with fresh clothes and everything else. And so it, uh, a crisis is very often uh, a remanagement of uh, what capital is about. Mm. Hence your interest in that water cycle, the hydrological cycle that you talk about in the book. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, capital circulates. It begins as money, and then money is used to buy some commodities, which are then made, and they're put into work, and, and new commodities are made, and then they're sold, and then it goes back to money, and then it comes back again, and it goes round and round and round. And it starts to be very elaborate in terms of some of the contextual conditions under which this can happen. So I try to sort of understand uh, the circulation of it, and then I also... Uh, try to say, well, what happens when this is no longer a cycle but a spiral? And that's the important point, I think, that we look at, which is that a spiral, and we, it's, it's no accident that we use phrases like things spiral out of control. Right. Capital is always spiraling out of control. How so? Explain that. Well, for instance, it produces, uh, it, it overaccumulates, it gets mm -hmm. too much uh, capital. And then people will sit there with a load of money and say, I need, a, I need to find a, a new way to invest. Where can I invest it? And they can't invest, so they go and put it in the art market or they go and put it somewhere else or they speculate in land values and, 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 and so on. So capital is constantly producing surpluses, which then has a hard time disposing of them. And, and uh, when it uh, often then hits a blockage, and if there's some blockage, like it produces too many commodities and there's not enough money to buy the commodities, then suddenly you get a crisis uh, where there are commodities sitting around unsold. But surplus, David, I mean, why can't that surplus spread? Why does it have to spiral and concentrate? Is there something about capital that is inimical to spreading out to more people? Well, uh, but if you spread out too much, then uh, you get real problems on your hands. For example, uh, China, as an interesting case, has had this huge development process. And in three years, China consumed 45% more cement than the United States consumed in 100 years. Goodness. Okay. In other words, they got out of the crisis of 2007, 2008 by an urbanization and infrastructure project, which spread masses and masses and masses of cement around. Mm -hmm. Now, if you kind of say 50 years' time, we're going to have three times that amount yeah. of cement spread around. So, yes, we can spread it around, but you're spreading cement around. Yeah. And pretty soon we'll be living with cement up to here. And, 
I, you know, so so there, there, there are certain limits and certain things that uh, cannot be spread around. The thing that worries me most is the one form of capital that can actually accumulate without limit is money. Right. And you can just add zeros to the money supply and actually it's kind of interesting. You know, Once upon a time to be a millionaire was kind of something special. Now you have to talk about billionaires and now you're talking about trillionaires and now you're talking about yeah. quadrillionaire economies and we kind of say, well, where are we going to go with this? Uh, and, and this is a, an accumulation process of a certain sort, which is, which is a bit insane, which is why I use the term the madness of economic reason, because economic, economists seem to think this is okay, and that this is the way things should go. And you kind of go, no, uh, this has implications uh, for everything, social relations, uh, uh, environmental conditions and, and uh, of course, uh, going back to the China case, the environmental conditions yeah. in China with all that cement being spread around are pretty disastrous and catastrophic. What did Marx say about finance capital and, and markets and stock markets like Wall Street? Well, he, 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 he talked about the fact that actually, uh, of course, credit uh, and debt uh, are very much about the future. And that what happens is that uh, the future gets foreclosed. When you're indebted, you've got to pay off your debt. And so a lot of the incentive these days is not greed mm -hmm. uh, for, for you know, more money, but it's, uh, uh, the incentive is you've got to pay off your debt. So an accumulation of debts then becomes one of the big ways in which the economy gets driven onwards and onwards and onwards. So this spiraling of debt, uh, is, which, which has gone on uh, particularly strongly over the last 30 years, is, uh, is again uh, something that is driving the economy in, in, in what I think are pretty crazy ways. So I keep thinking of Marx's reference to socially valuable labor. Was yes. that the phrase? Socially, yeah. Socially necessary labor time is, is what value So is. that social piece got put into the picture. Yes. yes. That was really, you emphasize over and over again. Yes. It's about social relations. Yes, yes, it's about always. Yes. So is there a clue in that to how we move forward as people are talking today so much more about valuing labor that has been socially necessary but not you see the social, not, not related yeah. to capital to money like women's labor unpaid labor the social labor we do for others is something that's terribly important but when it's mediated through uh, the market system then some forms of social labor are valuable and some are not and some are validated and some are not. Now, what that means is that capital itself, as a, as a form of circulation, doesn't really care about the environmental conditions. It doesn't really care about, uh, you know, who's taking responsibility for looking after the kids at home. It doesn't, you know, I mean, those are issues that the that, 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 that capital is not concerned with. Mm -hmm. And it basically says, let everybody else be bothered about all of that. We're simply going to get on with what we want to do, which is to take the money, put it into production, get more value, get more money, and keep on going, and we get more and more and more money. And we, of course, will see the distribution of that money uh, in various ways, but generally speaking, the, uh, the argument in, in Marx is concerned is that the money always ends up in the hands of the capitalist class. So if we begin to remunerate more of that socially valuable work, and if it becomes a bigger and bigger part of our economy, what happens? Capitalists just manage to rig that no, but game what, too? No, but what, yes, of course. No, what you see is that uh, actually many uh, domestic functions get privatized and get turned into commercial functions. I mean, here in New York, when I came here, I was amazed at the number of stores that said nails. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I thought, so they must be hardware stores. A lot of hammering going on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but of course, no. And, and take out food, it's, uh, all of these sorts of things. So that actually a lot of domestic functions have been privatized, commodified, and turned into something completely different. Now, does that make uh, gender relations much better, or does it leave gender relations in the same state as they were in before, or however, you know? So I, I, I think this kind of notion that somehow or other we have to sort of pay people for uh, wage labor in, in the household is a crazy idea. In fact, we want to stop as much as we can the whole kind of commodification of many of these of this social labor we do for others. And this again brings us back to, you know, are people going to be paid for helping out uh, when a hurricane strikes? 
And the answer is no, they do a lot of social labor and they do it willingly and, 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 and you know, voluntarily. And actually, in, in many ways, I think we value that kind of thing far more than we do if, if somebody sits there and says, I'm not going out there and rescuing anybody unless I'm paid. Right. We had Kate Rayworth on the show not long ago, Donut, Donut Economics, and she said her studies showed that when incentives were given for people to send their kids to school or get health vaccinations, people stopped doing it unless they were paid. Yes, right, exactly. So where are we in this cycle, this cycle of, of madness and money? I think we're at an inflection point in the history of capitalism, where uh, compound growth uh, in, say, 1850 was something that could be thought about and was not really a problem. But we've now got a global economy that's, I don't know, something like 60 or $70 trillion. And we're talking about compounding the rate of growth on that uh, over the next 50 years. And you see you're an astronomical. Yeah. And, and, and something's got to stop. And, and uh, we, we cannot continue along this, this line. Uh, you know, like I say, compound growth in 1850 when capital was just operating in a few little small areas of the world. Now it's all of China, now it's all of Indonesia, yeah. India, uh, Middle East, you know, I mean, you, you compound growth on all of that uh, for another 150 years, you know, forget it. I mean, it's... It's a whole yeah. lot of concrete. Yes. yes. David Harvey, the new book is Marx, Capital and the Madness of Economic Reason. Check it out. You can get more information and see my earlier interview with David about Hurricane Harvey at our website. Thanks, David. Thank Great you. Thank you. Always. <laughs>That was David Harvey. Among his most famous books is Rebel Cities, From the Right to the City to the Urban Revolution. And it was a kind of revolution of sorts that took place in Barcelona a few years back when community activist, anti-foreclosure organizer Ada Calau decided to run for mayor and won. Filmmaker Pau Faust followed that campaign from beginning to end. And we had a chance to talk with him about it not so long ago. We spoke right as that part of Spain was in the grips of an uprising around Catalan independence. He touches on that too. Here's Pau Faust. My name is Pau Faust and I am the director of the documentary film Ada for Major. Com imagino aquestes gravacions que comencem avui? La gent està farta de perdre, està farta de no pintar res, saps? Nosotros tenemos la capacidad de cambiar eso. És muy chuleria de, de proponer eso. La gran novetat és que aquesta setmana han començat les negociacions de veritat. I ens hem fotut una hòstia, però que ha estat, vamos, monumental. I uh, met Ada Colau when she was part of the anti-eviction movement. Ada was one of the most uh, popular uh, activists that uh, there was in Spain around 2011-2012. That was the moment when the evictions became like the image of the crisis in Spain, the families being evicted while the banks were being rescued. So the anti-eviction movement was a very popular movement and I was part of that movement as a filmmaker. And when Ada Colau and other people from the anti-eviction movement and other people from many other social movements decided to make this uh, citizen platform to try to win the local election in Barcelona. I realized that that was a very strong story, you know, the activist uh, running for mayor. And I also realized that uh, I had the possibility to have an access to how she was living this whole journey that she was about to start. So that's what the film is about and that's what we proposed to her. We said, uh, we want to film this and we want to film it while it's happening and we want to know how are you feeling while it's happening. I mean, the 15FM movement, the Indignados movement, was the, the, the moment where many young people, but people from different ages, but mainly young, said, we had enough. People were struggling to pay the mortgage, people were struggling to pay the food and to pay the school and to pay for their clothes, you know. And what was many times told by the governments and the people in charge is like, what is happening is your fault. We are all responsible. People really felt like uh, they don't represent us anymore. In these last years in Spain, uh, you have seen many people that uh, for the first time realized the power that you have when you are politically organized and when you have a 
clear objective and when you believe that what is happening is wrong. She represents for me the image of the organized citizenship that at some moment decides if we don't do it, they will not do it, you know. Después del debat hi haurà una votació, val? Votarem sí a l'acord, no a l'acord o i abstencions. Llavors, donarem per validat l'acord si hi ha una majoria qualificada de dos terços. Avui el que ens pota són els acords de confluència, és a dir, si anem al davant, fort anem al davant. Hem de tenir molt en compte que el que estem plantejant avui aquí no s'ha fet mai i molta gent ho ha somiat i ho ha desitjat molt de temps. I la possibilitat de guanyar Barcelona ajuntant-nos molta gent diferent avui està més a prop que mai i és esperança per moltíssima gent. M'hagués que agradat que la confluència fos d'una altra forma. No era aquesta la confluència que jo esperava. Jo estic d'acord amb que aquest acord a mi no és el que m'hauria agradat. El que passa és que ens hem trobat amb que el que són, el que podem confluir, tenien exigències. Si comparem les exigències que tenien aquests actors i el projecte o l'ideal que defensàvem des de Guanyem, jo crec que tenim un molt bon acord. Llavors jo espero que a partir d'ara el que passi a ser aquesta llista és només la part visible d'una família més grossa que el que vol és canviar a Barcelona. S'ha gestat una desconfiança cap al món de la política institucional i com que qui es fica a la política institucional ho fa o per vanitat o per buscar diners i és una cosa com bruta, com com que ja només apropar-t'hi, encara que siguis bona persona, ja t'has empastifat, ja ha caído, ja s'ha metit en política. Aquesta frase que la sents tant, i que a mi me la diuen per Twitter, i que intento no fer-hi cas perquè no m'ho crec, però que costa, i que a vegades t'afecta, i a mi m'afecta. Hem tingut aquest moment d'introspecció, hem tingut aquest moment intern, però ara cal que sortim d'aquesta endogàmia. Ara hem de tancar tot això de la confluència, hem de començar a construir la confiança, hem de començar a parlar molt clarament de quina és la ciutat que realment volem i quina és la ciutat que no volem. Sí a la proposta presentada. see the institutions as a as a, another tool to change things but not as the ultimate tool and of course how can you do that with a, the responsibility that you have when you come from uh, social movements to share um, your weaknesses and we will learn out of it we can learn from mistakes this that in social movements is something that is positive in institutional politics it's something that is negative this could be part of this new way of doing politics and uh, she's saying in the film that she's realizing that this thing is not as easy as she in a naive way maybe was expecting now you have realized that politics is something a little more improvised than we think sometimes they were very surprised of the interpretation people gives to something they they did there was this joke like they think we are more smart than we are, you know? So maybe if the film was about a man who wants to be the president of a country, I would have learned that politics is something very abstract. I don't know. But my experience is that I realized that municipal politics, it's something more, um, it's more like an everyday situation that you have to solve in a way. Of course, you have to look forward, but there is always something in, in the everyday that affects you. So it's, it's, it's not as strategical as people think. No! Qué cabrona! Qué Querida, no. queridísima. Hoy tienes un debate muy importante. Sabem que tens molt bons assessors, pero también necesitas a las mejores asesoras. O sea, nosotras. Habla despacio. Porque un color chulo, vermel o verde. Natural y despeinado. 
y oblidad a las cámaras. Pero lo más importante, Ada. Sigas tú más de esa, Ada. Y olvídate de tanto argumentario. Si ya te lo sabes, todo. Y si en algún momento dudas o si intentan ponerte nerviosa. Acuérdate del primer desastre que paramos. De las primeras asambleas. De criminales. Que te salió del alma. Acuérdate de cómo yo llegué a la paz. Y yo, que no paraba de llorar. De la fuerza que nos ha dado. De la esperanza. Ada. Esas enseñanzas se valen. Y ahora, a nos toca recordar que no estás sola. Cuando paras, paré todas. Ada, a voy, se Vamos, Ada. ¡Malditos! <risa> dos personas. Eso sí, comencemos por saber y confrontar aquest punt el modelo de, de ciudad. Lo que se ha dicho es que usted no fa el que hauria de hacer, que por ejemplo es no. escuchar los vecinos y las vecinas. Many people were quite surprised about the fact that she is really made for the role. She is now a stronger political figure than she was two years ago. Uh, and many people see her as a very influential figure, not only in Barcelona, but in Catalonia and in Spain. And even though it's not easy to talk about everyday life problems when you have these situations like the referendum, um, many of the topics that were topics more related to social movements like pollution, gentrification, the problem with the tourism, uh, public space problems because of tourism and uh, the salary, um, like working contracts, many things that were more like demands from social movements right now are in the center of the, deba of the, of the political debates in Barcelona. <laughs> the terrorist attack was something that was very shocking for the whole city. And I, I think that it was something that, um, even with the tragedy, in a way it made more strong some beliefs that we, we have we are very proud of in Barcelona and, and people um, knew that this was something that could be used from a racist uh, point of view and, and people were very fast and also the local government very fast in saying now more than before we believe that we have to live all together and I think that the fact that she was, she was the mayor at that moment helped um, for this thing to happen. In the, and in the Catalan vote, which is what happened in the last days, it's been very important the position that the party that she is part of took, and it's it's a position that many people agree is that it's not only about um, yes or no, we want independence, we don't want independence. It's mainly about we want to vote, you know. Molt de temps que venim d'una situació de bloqueig, d'una situació de bloqueig entre Catalunya i el govern de l'Estat, precisament perquè no s'han proposat propostes sobre la taula, perquè no hi ha hagut diàleg, perquè no hi ha hagut negociació política. Per això em sembla evident que avui no estem parlant ni de la qüestió de si independència sí o no, no estem parlant tampoc d'una ruptura entre Catalunya i Espanya, estem parlant d'una ruptura entre, govern, entre Mariano Rajoy i el seu govern i Catalunya. We have seven political parties now in Catalunya. Three of them are openly pro-independence. Three of them are not only against independence, but they are even against the referendum. And there is one political movement that says, it's not about yes and no, it's about voting. Let's dialogue, let's find a solution, and let's vote in a proper referendum. And in this political movement, um, pro-independence people and people who are against independence can live together with no problem. What might the next system of media look like? Check it out at lauraflanders.com and thenextsystem.org. We've also completed a report on what assets exist in grassroots organizations to tell their own stories and how those assets might better connect. That too is available at our website. Check it out, join with us, become a subscriber to this program and support the platforms that carry it. We're counting on you. We can't do this alone. We can only do it together. But together, we can remake this media world. And we will. Thanks.